There is no greater power than the power of God, and everywhere we go, high or low, God is there with us. We'll ask you to stay seated for this first song. Come Christians, join to sing. still sing praises to you, to be able to gather together. We thank you for the way you care for us and watch over us. We know, Lord, of the loss that has happened this last week, and uh, we mourn with those who mourn, weep with those who weep, and we pray for those who've been left behind by loved ones, and we pray that you'll comfort them this week and in the next weeks, and when we gather and we see one another and can express our sincere sadness for their loss, but we praise you for bringing another of your faithful ones back into your presence to live with you eternally, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity to have your word before us today to encourage us, to challenge us, to enlighten our eyes to the truth as you present it. May we not be carried away by the winds of doctrine, by the thoughts of man, by the philosophies that people cling to to give them meaning but may we look to your word for what you offer. We thank you for all this. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, whose death, burial, and resurrection we will celebrate today. We pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. 
I have a couple of announcements to make. Tonight's Roman study is going to happen like normal, but we're moving it back to 5 o'clock. So if you normally come on our Sunday night Roman study, it's going to happen at 5 o'clock tonight, 5 until 6 o'clock. Um, Secret Sister, if you have signed up for Secret Sister, you should probably be getting a packet handed to you by Barb. Um, uh, and if for some reason she doesn't spot you or you don't come to see her, we'll put it in the mailboxes. Um, you can pick it up there. Sue Mack, who passed away this last week, who was a former member of our church, her funeral is this coming Friday at 1 p.m. at Seneca Community Church. We mentioned that that service will also be live streamed on Seneca Community's Facebook page and YouTube page. So that'll be available, that service is at 1 o'clock um, at Seneca Community Church. Um, the church has enough space for about 150 people to gather in, uh, in social distancing in two different spaces. So if you want more information, you can uh, talk to me about that. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 16, 8 and 9. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. We're going to sing a couple of songs that speak about how God lifts us up and how we can be joyful because of him. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, says he who had the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, 
who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, who, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You guys recognize yourself in that picture, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that looks like you in that picture. So what gets you in trouble at home? Yelling? Anything else? Get you in trouble at home? Not willing to admit it? Screaming? Here, let me give you some choices. Which is worse? I'm going to give you a choice. Which is worse for getting you in trouble? Talking? Oh, I'm going to give you two choices. Talking back to your parents or pretending you don't hear them. Okay, raise your hand if talking back to your parents is worse, or pretending you don't hear them is worse. Which is? Pretending you don't hear them? Talking back, at least they're, you're acknowledging that you heard them, pretending you didn't hear them. That one's bad. Okay, here's another one. Which is worse? Complaining about the food you've been given to eat, or Complaining about the clothes you've been told to wear. Which is worse? Complaining about the food is worse? Who thinks complaining about the clothes you have to wear? <laughs> Are you told sometimes what you have to wear? No, never, and you're saying yes. You're brothers. So one of you is told what to wear and the other is not? <laughs> oh, okay. So, so, so sometimes we get in trouble for complaining, right? You ever say, oh, I don't like this, and the food they put in front of you? Or does that just happen when you go to grandma's house? Or you go someplace else? Well, here's the last one. Which do you get in more trouble for, yelling or hitting? Hitting is worse? Hitting is worse? Hitting is worse? Both are worse? Which one do you do more often, hit or yell? You hit? You guys are all very rotten kids, aren't you? You're not rotten? Do you ever yell at your brother? Do you ever hit him? Okay, you're rotten. Do you ever complain about your clothes? Complain about the food. Do you ever ignore your mother? <laughs> Do you ever talk back to her? You are so rotten, you're just like your grandfather. Grandfather Schweitzer. 
He's not here now. He'll be here later. I'll let him know that I said that. Uh, you know, so we get in trouble for a lot of things. Here's the question. Did Jesus ever get in trouble at home? What do you think? Well, he did sin, so he probably didn't yell. He probably didn't ignore his mother. He probably didn't complain about the food. He probably didn't complain about the clothes he wore. He probably didn't hit anybody, but he did get in trouble. Let me read you from Mark chapter 6. He got in trouble. Listen to this. Mark chapter 6. And Jesus went out from where he was, and he came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many of the people who heard him were astonished and said, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which he has given him? And what mighty works is he able to perform with his hands? Here's what they said. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Jesus goes to his hometown, and he starts teaching them truth, and they go, we don't like you. We don't know where you got this stuff. You're just a carpenter. You're nobody. And they didn't like him. Listen to what happened. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except when he's at home among his own relatives in his own house. The people in his own hometown didn't like him. He was in trouble with them. And here's what it says. While he was there, he could do no mighty works among them. He was doing all sorts of miracles, and there in his hometown, because they didn't believe him, because they didn't like him, he couldn't do any mighty works. But here's what it says. Except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So he didn't do big, giant things, but what did he do? He helped one person here who was sick, and one person here who was sick. He helped a few people, because he wasn't a bad person. He wasn't like you and me. He didn't hit and yell. He didn't, he didn't get in trouble. He got in trouble for being good. And here's what it says. <sighs> he marveled because they didn't believe, and so he went to other villages and taught there. Jesus got in trouble for doing the right thing. And we talked about that in Sunday school yesterday. If you didn't see Sunday school yesterday, you go home and see Sunday school. It talks about how do you, treat, how do you handle a bully or what happens when you're the bully. Well, Jesus was never the bully, but he got in trouble because he did good things. Imagine if you got in trouble today for doing something good. The Bible says that's a good thing, to do good things even if people don't appreciate it. All right, you can have a seat with your families. We are in Revelation chapter 2. Let me get my Bible open here. If you could choose any city in the entire world to visit, which would it be? If you could choose any city in the world to visit. I sometimes watch uh, House Hunters International. And uh, I was watching a woman the other day who had a two-year-old daughter and was moving to a village in Italy, and they showed her a house that had an open staircase to the second floor. When I say open, it was like steps sticking out of the wall, no railings and nothing through. She goes, I'm not sure that's going to work. And the realtor says, but it will in about five years. <laughs> if you could choose any city. Now, if you had to move to one of the top ten cities in the world, you were forced to move to one of the top ten cities in the world. Which would you pick of those top ten? Now, according to several organizations that rank world cities, here are some of the choices you would have of the top ten cities. Would you move to London? London is filled with cool, clean air, spectacular parks, and above all else, royalty. Would you move to London where there are the royals? Well, maybe you would choose number two. The second best city in the world is New York. You might say, <laughs> not right now, but this is the ranking from 2021. This is the brand new ranking that's come out, and here's why New York is such a great choice. It is full of energy, museums, and toughness, was the word they used, to come back from every adversity. And New York has been known for that. Come back from tough times, and they'll come back again. Would you choose to live in New York? 
Now, a person maybe who lives over in England or France would say, yes, I'd love to live in New York. Maybe those of us who live in New York are saying, you've got to be kidding. Well, how would you prefer to go to the number three city? Would you move to Paris? Would you move to Paris? Paris, of course, is known for its art, its food, spectacular architecture. Would you move to Paris? It's also crowded, it's also expensive, but so is New York, and so is London. Would you move to Moscow? That's number four. Would you move to Tokyo? That's number five. Would you move to Dubai? That's number six. Those are the top six. That nice desert landscape in Dubai. What might draw you to one place over another of those great cities? Would you go to a city because of its climate? We had a tough week, right? We had a tough couple of weeks, really cold, and then a bunch of snow. Would you move for its climate? Would you move because the architecture is spectacular? You know, they got the old buildings. They got these amazing structures and bridges. Would you go because of its history? Would you move to a city because it's got this amazing history? Now, America doesn't have a lot of history. You can't go to many cities in America with much more than a couple hundred years of history. But you go overseas, and you can find cities that are 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old. It's the architecture that is amazing. Would you move to another city because there's opportunity there? I mean, the opportunities in that city just, just astound you. The things you could do, the things you could experience. Would you move to another city because it's got a lot of energy? It's exciting. They talk about cities that never sleep. Hong Kong, New York, Tokyo. I mean, they're up. It's 24 hours a day. It's, it, it, it never sleeps. Or would you move to a city that's known because it's very calm? It's quiet. It settles down at night. People go to bed. The streets are not crowded. Now, if you were going to live and serve God in that city, whichever city you would choose, what challenges might you face living in that city? What opportunities might be uniquely available in a city? Think about this. When, uh, when they first worked on the church plant that we got involved in in, in Queens, there are apartment buildings in Queens that have 10,000 people. In a single building, 10,000 people live. And, and maybe that seems astounding to you, but the opportunities to reach people because there's just so many people. The church that John writes to third, this church of Pergamos, dwells in that kind of a city. When we think of the top 10 cities of the world today, Pergamos is one of those cities. For the Roman Empire, it is one of the exciting cities in Asia Minor. It is a center of commerce. It is a center of education. It is a center of religion. And it's a center of power in Asia Minor. Pergamos is. It was, in many respects, in Asia Minor, it was the place to be. And the Christians of Pergamos live right in the middle of that. Are there Christians who live in Paris? Yes. Are there Christians who live in New York? Certainly. Are there Christians in Tokyo and Moscow, Dubai? There are Christians in all of those major cities. Where does this church serve? Well, Pergamos is a wealthy city. It's the provincial capital of Roman Asia. It boasts a university with a library of 200,000 volumes, which is the second largest library in the ancient world, only behind Alexandria in Egypt. Only the library in Alexandria is larger than Pergamos that has 200,000 volumes. Think about 200,000 books, handwritten, hand-sewn, hand-collected, not mass-produced. Yes, you can go into a bookstore today and maybe find 200,000 volumes but not in the ancient world, when every book was made by hand. Pergamus developed a thing called vellum, which is writing material made out of animal skin. And you might ask, why did they develop that? Well, at the time, parchment, that was the main means of creating books, was produced in Alexandria, Egypt. When Pergamus announced that they were going to build the largest library in the world, the people who made parchment in Alexandria, Egypt, decided to no longer ship parchment to Pergamos so they could not produce books, so they could not build a larger library and supersede Alexandria as the learning center of the world. And Pergamos set out and said, you're not going to stop us. They developed vellum using animal skins 
to produce paper upon which to write their books. Pergamos is a wealthy city. It's also a worshiping city. Pergamos worship the gods Athena, Asclepius, Dionysius, and Zeus. They were their major gods. They also built the very first temple to emperor worship. The emperor worship of Augustus was built in AD 29. The first temple ever built in Rome to honor one of their Caesars as God was built in this city. Eventually, they built three temples in the city to the worship of the emperor. Dionysus was the god of the royal kings, and Asclepius was the savior god of healing. So they raised up the things that were most important to them, power, health, and they built monuments and worshiped God and erected temples. Because of that, Pergamos was a very wicked city. It says in our text here, it is where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells. Think about a city today in which, in your estimation, there is plenty of sin to go around. Now, the most famous sin city is Las Vegas, right? Las Vegas has been known for decades and decades as sin city. Well, about 25 years ago, Las Vegas said, we have to change our image. So they built casinos and hotels that would attract families with roller coasters and circus acts and, and all sorts of family friendly. Let me tell you right now, I've been to Vegas several times. It's not family friendly. In fact, I was looking up some hotels the other day because we were thinking of making a trip down that way and heading off to some other places and looking for a hotel. And a couple of the hotels were listed as adult-only hotels. No kids allowed, no kids welcome, because Las Vegas is still kind of known as Sin City. Think of all the major metropolitan areas across the world and the amount of wickedness that is allowed to flourish within the confines of millions and millions of people. Well, according to John, according to the words of Christ himself, Satan dwells there. Satan has a throne there. Think it's a place of political power. It's a place of religious power. It's a place of intellectual influence. And Jesus says Satan is in the middle of that. With their false gods, their false worship, their idolatry, and their immorality. So think about where we serve. So none of us live in a major city. And I suppose if I polled most of you, few of you are going to say yes. If I had a chance, I would live in Paris, or I'd live in London, or I'd live in Rome, or I'd go to Dubai. Most of us probably would say, no, I... I kind of like, maybe you don't want to live in New York your whole life. Maybe you like to go a little better climate, but you're probably not going to gravitate to some city where you sell your car and you ride mass transit. So where do we live? Where do we serve? Well, we live in the wealthiest country in the world. On a national level, we live in the wealthiest country in the world. On a state level, we live in a very secular state that is dominated by politics, is it not? Isn't New York dominated by politics? No matter what your politics are, the, but New Yorkers just love to fight about politics. And, and, and po politicians of the same viewpoint in New York fight each other as vehemently as if they had different viewpoints. I mean, they, like, they just like all hate each other. That's New York. Politically, they hate each other. Maybe personally, they like each other, but politically, we live in that kind of a state. Now, we live in a county a county that I think would be characterized as committed to education, our county. I mean, we, we filled ourselves with not only a major university, but also a major private college, and then the local colleges, and there's, there's, this, there's this influence of education around the county in which we live. And then we live in a village. And the village of Trumans, I thought about this quite a bit. What is the village of Trumans like? Now, I've been part of the village now here for just about 17 and a half years. I've been part of the zoning board for 16 years, 16 plus years, and I've seen a lot of people come and go through the village, and, and I've heard a lot. I've been part of the comprehensive plan in the village, part of zoning revision. See what people value. Here's what people value for the most part in the village of Trumansburg. They value history and tradition and progressive thinking. That's what our village. They want to preserve the old buildings as they are, there's history. They put up the signs in different places. They did the carvings in the sidewalk. They talked about historical data. 
They love their history. They love their tradition. But they're also very progressive. And they're thinking as influenced by education. And so there's this constant battle going on in, in the village of Trubensburg. Do we become progressive and be modern, but we also want to maintain tradition? We don't, we don't want to build a big, we don't want to let, 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 let a lot of people in to change us, but we'll let some people in who are like us. It's an interesting place in which Trumansburg is. Different than Dryden, different than Groton, different than Spencer, different than Lodi, than, than Ovid. It's very different than Romulus. I mean, you just go north a little bit, and those villages are very different than Trumansburg. Well, this is where we live. This is where we serve. So how does Jesus approach the believers who are in Pergamos? How might he approach us if he was going to speak to us? So notice who is Jesus here in verse 12. Verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Who is Jesus? He's the one with the sword. The sword represents Jesus' ability to do two things. He separates the believer from the world. He has the ability to take the sword and separate us from the world in which we live. He says, look, you're a believer and you're living in Pergamos. You're a believer and you're living in a city that is devoted to, and then he could describe all the things it's devoted to. You're a believer who lives in Trumansburg. You're a believer who lives in Tompkins County. You're a believer who lives in New York. You're a believer who lives in the United States of America. I'm going to separate you from those things within your place that you should not be part of. That's the first thing. The second thing Christ uses the sword for is to condemn the world for its sin. The first one he's going to describe in this letter. He's going to describe how they need to be separated from their world. The second part of the work of the sword is found in Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15 it says this. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. When you get to the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus, who is the one with this sharp two-edged sword, uses one side of the sword to strike the nations. In verse 21, he says this, And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. So Revelation 19, finally, Jesus is presented as the one who goes after the nations, goes after the wickedness of man, and it's been demonstrated in all the previous chapters. And by chapter 19, he says, look, Christ returns on a horse, and he uses the sword, which proceeds from his mouth, to destroy the wicked, to punish man for his sin. The imagery here is very graphic in chapter 19. It's very graphic. It's very real. The result is drastic, and it's final. It's not like a a punishment for a moment, and then they recover from it. It is the finish to the wicked world. The method is probably God's spoken word. The imagery is a sword, but the method is probably God speaking, Christ speaking. Think about this. Christ creates the world through his words. Let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. Let us make man, and there was. Why would we think it strange that at the end of the age, through his words, he'd say, let them be destroyed. Let them be killed. Let them die. So the picture is graphic, and the destruction is what appears to be permanent. So when Jesus concludes the third letter to Pergamos, here's how he concludes it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So when Jesus concludes his letter by saying, listen, what he might be saying to us is, listen, pay attention to what I'm about to say. I'm going to describe a city. I'm going to describe a time, and everybody else needs to listen in. You ever find yourself listening into someone else's conversation? I mean, not like purposefully, but all of a sudden you hear something, and it, it piques your interest. You catch a word, you catch a name, you catch a situation, and then you begin to listen in. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm having a conversation with Pergamos, the believers who are at the church in Pergamos, but I want you to listen in. I want you to hear what I have to say, and I want you to pay attention to it. So Jesus has come here to declare the truth. He has come to call out sin 
He has come to challenge the believers to stay true to the course. So we should listen in and consider what he might say that we need equally for our own lives. So what does Pergamus need? Verse 13. What does Pergamus need? He says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwelt. He says, what do you need? You need, in the midst of Satan's attack, he says, you're living in a place where Satan is attacking. You are living in a time when Satan has the stronghold. He's the center of the stronghold. Do you ever feel like, as you watch what's been happening to our nation, more our nation than maybe more locally, that it appears there seems to be a greater freedom in our nation for people to be oppressive to others? There's a greater freedom for people to be, to be publicly angry with one another. I mean, have we ever seen it such as we are seeing it today? From every spectrum, from every side of the story, people yelling at one another. We haven't gotten to the stage like kids where they're hitting. I mean, for the most part, people aren't hitting each other. But they certainly are yelling at each other. When a congresswoman can be banned from participation in Congress because of something she said, that's unprecedented. And the amount of, of verbalization of hatred is, is disturbing. Do you think Satan is going, ha, I'm getting it right where I want it. I'm going to get it to the point where eventually I'm going to get these people to hit each other. Pergamus has moved to hitting. They're at the hitting stage. And here's what Jesus wants them to remember. He says, remember the history of your commitment. You've been living in a terrible world. You've been living in a tough time. You're living in a place where Satan has control of the culture. And you have been faithful. These are the people who saw the first temple built to emperor worship. They're living in a city that is boastful of its commitment to the worship of a man. We're moving that direction, right? We're moving that direction where men, I say men generically, men and women are being elevated as being, uh, being the saviors of our world, the saviors of our culture, the saviors of our economy. Are we not lifting up men to save the day? That's what they were doing in Pergamos. But they have remained loyal to God. I've been thinking about it. Uh, I meet with a few pastors around here, and we've done it for years and years, and since the pandemic, we've only gotten together once. I invited the pastors over here for a lunch a few months ago, and I was telling Vicki, I says, I guess I'm going to have to invite them again because none of them seem to want to get together. None of them seem to want to, like, offer an invitation. And I says, so I think I'm going to invite them again. So I've been thinking about this the last couple of days. I says, so if I get these guys together, what should we talk about? And the thing that I thought about was a couple articles I read recently is what does it mean to be a national Christian? Is nationalism and Christianity similar? Well, according to what Jesus is saying to the city of Pergamos, he's saying, look, you have a world in which you could be nationally loyal to it, but I appreciate you've been loyal to me, not to your world. Have we, are we crossing the line in the nature of our culture, in the nature of our state, in the nature of our communities, in the nature of our nation? Are we crossing the line where our loyalty to God is going to become more and more at odds with loyalty to our leaders? Our bureaucrats, our political figures, our educational hierarchy. At what point? Remember, years ago, people really moved toward homeschooling because they didn't like the curriculum being taught in the, in the public schools. And that's kind of settled out, and, and people are kind of where they're at. Are we rising to a new level of this? Here's what Jesus says to the church. Remember the history of your commitment. You've been loyal to me. They've held fast to the faith. 
Apparently, they've refused to deny Christ. It's gotten to the point where they're being told, you can't follow Christ, you have to follow the emperor. Like the days of Daniel. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Will you bow to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar? And they said, no, we won't. That's what's happening in this city. And they've held fast. And they should remember the price some have paid. Because he mentions Antipas here. He's the first. Or he's the prominent one. Now, he's certainly not. He's certainly not a national hero, Antipas. He's not, he's not a provincial hero. He's not a hero for the city. He's a hero to the brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the first guy dragged out and killed for not falling in worship to the emperor or to the other gods. He is killed for his faith. Why? Because Satan stands there. Satan has made a strategic move here in Pergamos. Satan has decided it is worth taking the risk of killing one of these Christians. Now, what we've seen through history is when Christians are killed, other Christians become stronger in their faith. Now, not all who have claimed to be Christians stay faithful. But those who are become stronger. Well, Satan's making a strategic move here. In the city of Pergamos, he kills Antipas. And the believers remain strong, even though one of theirs has actually died. What is our history of commitment? What is your history of commitment? Can you remember back to when you turned to Christ, if, you, if you've done that, when you turned to Christ? Can you think back of that moment? Can you remember when you turned from the world and said, you know, there's things the world is about, there's philosophies, there's, there's lies, and I am not going to follow them, and I'm not going to accept them, and I'm not going to walk in those ways. How faithful to Christ have we been? How faithful have we had to be? Have we known anyone? Have any of us known anyone who was forced to face the greatest attacks against Christianity? Probably most of us would say no. We haven't known anybody personally. Oh, we've heard stories of missionaries, and we've heard stories of, of other cultures, and we've heard story of what's going on in other places around the world. We got a, we got a note from uh, Doug Combs this week, a pastor from Myanmar, wrote to Doug and said, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. With the coup that has occurred in our nation, things are worse for the Christians than they were. And Myanmar has been a horrible place for Christianity. And the work that Doug Combs does is encouraging Christians from outside the country who can freely pass into the country to go in and evangelize and do that. And this pastor who was there in Myanmar saying, pray for us. So we hear of those things, and we can maybe relate a little bit, but will we maybe in our own particular future see an opportunity where we will be asked to be faithful regardless of the price that needs to be paid? So what is Jesus' concern here in verse 14? So here's what he says. I have a few things against you. You've been faithful, but I've got a few concerns. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. What is he saying? There are some people within the church of Pergamos who have strayed from the truth. They've strayed from the truth. He mentions two things. The Nicolaitans, which he, no place in the scriptures does it describe what that teaching was. And then he mentions Balaam. Balaam is an Old Testament figure. Balaam is someone who tried to lead Israel astray through the use of Balak, a prophet, who came and got the women of a foreign country to entice the men of Israel to marry them and to worship false gods. They couldn't get Israel just to worship false gods, so they enticed them through marriage, marry all these beautiful foreign women, 
And of course, those foreign women will convince their husbands to add the false gods to the worship of God. That's the story of Balaam. That's the story of Balak. Somehow, this reference is describing what's going on in the city of Pergamos. In some way, the people in Pergamos, in the church, have continued to participate in the pagan festivals. Remember, this is a city filled with pagan idolatry. There are temples. There is worship. There are festivals. I was, I was watching a, a YouTube video on the, the 10 base, best places for Americans to emigrate to in your retirement years. And six of them were in Mexico. Six different towns, villages, cities in Mexico are the best places for Americans to go because there's a lot of English speaking and there's a lot of stuff. And one of the things they were talking about in all these Mexico cities, all these Mexico villages that Vicky and I have experienced in the times we've gone to Cabo is they have festivals all the time. I mean, they have festivals every month. There's always a celebration going on. I mean, maybe it's because their life isn't so great that they need to have a celebration. Their evenings are free, and they're not inundated with all sorts of other stuff, so they gather in the square, and they have a dance, and they have music, and they just enjoy themselves. That's Pergamos. One of the biggest struggles the church has had, the church has had in Las Vegas, and we've met a lot of believers, Vicki and I, over the years in Vegas, is living in a city that never sleeps, that is filled with behavior that is not godly. And some of the worship musicians in the churches, for their living, play in the casinos. They're musicians who've come to Christ. And they have debated, do we quit our jobs, which is the only reason why we live here in Vegas, quit our jobs in order to serve in the church. But if we quit our jobs, we're going to have to leave Vegas, so we're not going to serve in the church. What do we do? Do I play in the club till midnight on a Friday night so I can play in church Saturday afternoon for the Saturday service or Sunday morning for one of the Sunday morning services? What do I do? Here in Pergamos was a group of believers who had not pulled themselves away from the things that were happening in their cities. This is including things like sacrificial feasts. They had days of gluttony and drunkenness, the city, as part of their festivals to their gods. And they certainly had what, what we can't fully appreciate was temple prostitution. Temple prostitution was they were living in a society where there was a lot of sexual freedom. And the temple was a place where you could participate in it in a way that the world says it's okay. This is all right. It would be similar in some degree to the amount of permissible immorality allowed in movies and television and cable and streaming. I mean, we live in a world where 20 years ago on the airwaves, certain things would never be shown, and now it's become commonplace and permissible. Well, they're living in a culture that is driven by sexuality, particularly related to its religion, and people in the church were saying, you know, everybody's doing it. It's, all, it's part of who we are. Why should we be bent about it? A survey done more recently of young Christian believers in American culture has found an astounding number who don't view certain cultural behaviors in America as being sinful. Topping the list would be homosexuality and abortion. Wow. There's the woman's right to choose, and there's everyone's right to choose. And over time, Satan has won some great victories in changing people's mind as to what is right and to what is wrong. So in this church, they have continued in the cultural celebrations and the freedoms while still professing their faith in Christ. How many cultural customs and freedoms surround us that entice us to do what Jesus says in this letter? He says, I hate. He says, the Nicolaitans, I hate. And he's saying, some of you are doing that. Think about all of the cultural enticements in a world in which we live and think how easy it has been for us to have been moved from maybe where we were at one point 
to where we are now and to where we might go. And God is saying to Pergamos, there's a lot who strayed and I hate it. For Jesus, he warns those not only who've strayed, but those who've allowed their fellow believers to stray. So when he writes to this church, he says, look, some in the church have strayed, but some of you have let them stray. See, for Jesus, it appears to be unacceptable to say these phrases. For Jesus, it's wrong to say, well, it's really none of my business. It's really none of my business what so-and-so is doing. For Jesus, it's wrong to say, well, it's not for me to say. Jesus says, it is for you to say. And then he says, it's unacceptable to say live and let live. Or the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Jesus says, no, you can't say that. You can't do that. You can't be that. And then there's the phrase that we will find ourselves saying, well, it could be worse. You know? Your kid comes to you and says, well, I'm doing this. And you're going, oh. And then you say to yourself, well, it could be worse. When it could be worse here, later it becomes it could be worse here. It could be worse here. Sin can always be worse. And so Jesus writes to this church and says, you've allowed your fellow believers to stray. So what suggestion does he make? He makes two suggestions. The first is this, verse 16, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So in speaking to those who are sinning, okay, so to the ones who have actually strayed, to the ones who are still participating in the worldly cu uh, customs, he says this to them, Rep repent or face judgment. So to that group of believers who are still in the church, but are participating in all of these things that he has, when he writes these things, they know exactly what he's talking about. If Jesus were writing to us, he would use imagery that we would know exactly what he's talking about. And he says, repent or face judgment. He says, I'm going to come on them. Now he's assuming the ones who are first going to read this are the ones who've been faithful. And he says, I'm going to come on those who've strayed. Repent. So what's the second message he says? Repent and warn them. See, because the people who've been in the church and have not been warning their fellow brothers and sisters who've been straying, he says, you need to repent of your failure to warn them, and you need to begin to warn them with the idea that there's the possibility they will repent and come back. They will change their behavior. They will do what's right. You know it. You know, you and I, we know the same thing. There, none of us want to confront someone else we don't none of us want to put ourselves in a position where another person won't like us because of what we say we don't so we'll call the pastor and have him do it we'll call someone else and say hey you you need to know so and so's doing something you need to do something about it none of us want to do that and that's what jesus is saying to this church he's saying look if you're the one who's straying away, if you're the one who's stepping out, you need to come back. And if you're the one who knows it's going on and you're not saying anything, you need to warn them. You need to draw them back. Is it too late for me? Is it too late for them? Well, here's what he says in verse 17. Hear what the Spirit says to him who overcomes, I'll give a new name. He concludes this message with this idea, it's never too late and you're never too far. You're never too far. We will find ourselves, every one of us, at any given moment straying from God. We're a fallen, sinful people, still susceptible to Satan's temptations and the temptations that well up in our own hearts, that we can stray. And Jesus says, it's never too late to repent and come back. And you've never gone too far. You can hear the stories of the ones who have found themselves at the end of their life. They have strayed so far into sinful behavior that they are completely self-destroyed. Just they haven't realized it and they haven't died yet, but they're there. And God miraculously brings them all the way back. And those stories we love to celebrate. 
But here's the story that we should pursue. Most of us aren't going to stray so far that we are self-destructive. Most of us stray just far enough that we're accepting of it. And it could be worse, and we say it about ourselves. It's nobody's business. And Jesus says, you're never too far. You're never too close that you can't come back. One of the things we do when we have communion like we're having this morning is we take it as a moment to remind ourselves how far God went to draw us in. Imagine if he said, well, I'm only willing to go so far. If God set limits on his grace, set limits on his forgiveness, what would be the tipping point where we might go too far? And God would say, none for you. Instead, we come to the communion table and realize there was no person too far from God. There was no person where it was too late for God. I mean, there's a guy hanging next to Jesus on a cross about to breathe his last because he was the worst of the worst in their culture. And Jesus says, today, we can fix all of this. If you'll turn, <laughs> that man didn't have a chance to turn from his wicked ways and change his life and do things for God. All he had the ability to do was to turn to God. That's what the communion table is about, and that's what we'll participate in in a few moments. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be reminded that you will draw us back in through our repentance into a position with you that honors you, that you will give us the strength to be faithful to you when our world becomes increasingly antagonistic to the truth and to your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to remain faithful. Help us to notice those among us and ourselves when we stray that we might draw ourselves and others back to you in a way that gives you the glory and recognizes your right to rule the world and to judge our lives. We thank you for the grace you gave us in just giving us this message so that we could understand more about ourselves. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 14, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. In this account in Mark, different from Matthew, different from Corinthians, Jesus mentions the fact that in the taking of the elements and in taking of the wine particularly that represented his blood, he makes the comment that this was the end of this relationship that he was having with them. The fellowship he was having with them was ending here. He was going to pay for sin. He was going to take sin upon himself. He was going to be the penalty of sin. It was going to be a separation between him and them. And though he would rise from the dead and come back, he would not come into fellowship with them until sin was completely defeated in all men's lives and the kingdom returned and all righteousness is restored. So we take the elements now not because we're righteous, but because we're looking forward to the righteousness that will someday truly be ours and we will be in the presence of Christ and fellowshipping with him. It's still looking forward. It's looking back to what he's done, but it's looking forward to what he will still do in our lives. Unlike the believers in Pergamos, some who had strayed and some who had let others stray, Jesus is saying, look, you will not reach perfection here. You will continually need to repent. You'll continually need to straighten out. You'll continually need to come back. But in this moment of taking this, you're saying, yes, at some point, Christ will perfect me. And I won't have to struggle any longer. Paul looked forward to that. To the day when he would see Christ face to face and all of this would be set aside. And all the struggle and all the battle and all the sin. So as we come and we take the communion, um, again, we encourage those in the front rows to come through the center aisle, those in the back rows to go around the outside and come back through. As you take the communion, make sure you get both cups both the bread is in the bottom and the juice is in the top. And if you're a believer in Christ and you're walking with him and you're committed to being faithful to him, we invite you to come and to gather with us and to take the elements with us. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have done in setting up a plan in which your son would devote himself selflessly to our salvation from sin. And Lord, as we take these elements, let us not be forgetful of what was paid, but look forward to what we will experience when you draw us to yourself in perfection and completion and maturity, and we see you face to face. We look forward to that. Help us to be faithful in the intervening hours and days and months and years so that people might see you through us. We pray this in his name. Amen. You take all the pieces of my life, put them back together, make it all alright. Oh, you forgive me. Only you can heal my broken heart, make all things new with a brand new start. Oh, you forgive me. You forgive me. I try so hard to do things right but i make the wrong choice sometimes and you forgive me no one knows me god like you you see who i am not what i do and you forgive me you take all the pieces of my life put them back together make it all Give me.
It says to the disciples, take eat. This is my body. He takes the cup and says, this is my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. song we'd like to conclude with Yeah.